Hi, and welcome to our latest ACNC webinar. Today's session focuses on some of the key information that new charity board members should be armed with as they take their place on a charities board, as well as some of the things they should be aware of when stepping into the role. My name's Chris Richards, and I'm from the ACNC's education team. With me today is my colleague, Matt Crichton. Hi, Matt. Hello, hello everyone. Now, before we launch into the webinar, uh, the usual few housekeeping matters, which we'll rattle through quick smart. First up, if you've got any troubles with the audio for our uh, webinar today, you can try listening through your phone. You can call the number listed in the email you will have received upon sign up and uh, put in an access code and listen to the webinar that way. You can also ask a question at any time through the webinar by using the tools in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. Uh, we have our colleagues Heath and Michael ready, waiting and with uh, typing fingers prepared to respond to any questions that come through. As we go along today, we'll try and answer all the questions that come through, but depending on the quantity of them, we may not be able to get to everyone. If your question isn't answered, please feel free to send us uh, an email and we will get back to you. We will allow a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. So if you wanted to watch the presentation and save your questions until the end, you can do that as well. We are recording this webinar and this recording as well as the transcript uh, and the slides, uh, they'll be published on the webinar, on the webinar, on the website in a couple of days. Uh, this also means you don't have to write down all the website references in the, uh, in the presentation today. Uh, they'll be contained in a follow-up email that we'll get out to you uh, ASAP. And finally, as usual, we really value your feedback. If you have any suggestions for ways we can improve our webinars, please let us know in the short survey at the end of the webinar or send us an email with your comments. Okie dokie. Um, we will cover a number of topics today, which you should be able to see on your screen now. Um, we got, um, well, these, this is an overview of what we'll cover today. I have um, five quick questions to ask. So when you start on a charities board, these are the sort of questions you should ask yourself um, to make sure that you're um, prepared for the beginning of your role. We'll have a look at the ACNC, just what the ACNC does and what it requires of charities. We'll have a look at the duties of responsible persons and just a quick note on responsible persons. You might see the, the phrase responsible persons used a fair bit throughout the webinar and then sometimes you'll see the word board members, the phrase board members used. They're effectively an inter interchangeable phrase. The ACNC refers to the people that are in charge of a charity as responsible persons. So in this dot point here when we say duties of responsible persons, that may as well say duties for board members, committee members, or whatever your whatever idiosyncratic phrase you have for your organisation. We'll also have a look at some general tips for board members. There we go, there's the interchangeable <laughs> phrase right there. And finally, we'll just give you some, um, just some main points to take away from this once, once we're done. So, um, and also at the end, we, as Chris mentioned, we will have some Q&A. So if there have been some questions come up through throughout the webinar, we'll take the time at the end, five or 10 minutes or so to, to answer to answer those. Um, okay, so I'll pass you over to Chris to continue. No probs. Now, um, last month's webinar, uh, you may have attended, you may remember that was uh, about annual general meetings. So after the annual general meeting, we've probably got quite a few new board members who have uh, joined up. So good on you for doing so. Um, what we would like to probably say to you all, if you have joined up, is to congratulate you. We've got about 56,000 registered charities uh, here in Australia, and they do rely on the contributions of board members um, who give up their time often without remuneration uh, to help the organisation they, they support. Um, without volunteers like these, including volunteer board members, uh, there's plenty of charities that would struggle to be as effective as they are and some of them may not even exist anymore. So a big thank you and a big acknowledgement to, uh, to all of you, uh, existing board members, new board members, bravo, good luck. So. We've got a few quick questions here that uh, you should perhaps, particularly new board members, should perhaps ask um, when you jump on board. Um, now, it's important to note 
uh, here that some of them you've probably already you know covered uh, as you've as you've gotten onto a board. Um, none of them are formal ACNC requirements, but what they are is important, I guess, in, in trying to ensure good governance and, and a high functioning board. And of course, every charity is different, as we often say. So there might be some extra questions you might need to ask that are particularly relevant to your charity. Uh, the ones we've listed here are, the first is to clarify your role. Uh, ensure you're clear on your role on the board and what your responsibilities will be. A positional role description can be very handy uh, here. Um, second point is an induction pack. Uh, have you got yours would be the question to ask. A properly inducted board member is a quickly productive board member. So if you haven't received an induction pack, talk to your charity about ensuring you have the information and the documents you need to hit the ground running. Uh, handover, handover processes are important. If you're taking over a specified board role, um, organise some time with your predecessor to sit down and discuss the ins and outs of that role, and that's a good idea. Uh, adequate and documented uh, handover processes are vital. Uh, meeting details uh, is, is another important one. It, it might sound pretty basic, but it's always a good idea to confirm when, where, how, uh, and how often meetings are staged, as well as how you'll receive things like uh, agendas and minutes. Uh, and the final thing, although it's not the final thing on the list on your screen, um, a rundown of your charity's duties to the ACNC should be a part of a charity's induction process or welcome pack, and all new board members should be clear on them. Now, we'll cover elements of these points in more detail throughout the webinar. But first up, just as a bit of an introduction, what is the ACNC and what do we do? Uh, thanks, Chris. It, it, the ACNC is, is the uh, independent national regulator of charities, and uh, the ACNC has five main functions. As you can see on the screen, we register charities. We maintain a, um, the charity register, which is an online database of all registered charities, which has some information about all registered charities on the internet. It's free for everyone, can, in, is searchable. So if you wanted to look up some information about a particular charity, you can go to the charity register and do so. We, we provide advice, guidance and education for charities about a range of things, particularly on their obligations to the ACNC. Of course, we monitor charity compliance with those obligations. So if charities um, get in a bit of trouble and um, that trouble is something that the ACNC can look into, that's part of what we do. And finally, we have responsibility in our work to, to try and reduce red tape for charities and that may be um, working on streamlined reporting um, arrangements with, with state and territory governments or, or other ways to, to try and um, reduce the reporting reporting burden that many charities face. But there is a lot more information about all of these points in particular on the ACNC website. If you go to acnc.gov.au forward slash um, about, you can read all about that. And the searchable online database is there, is listed there as well with forward slash charity register. All right, now we've mentioned responsible persons uh, a couple of minutes back. Um, as we mentioned before, it's the term that the ACNC uses to describe the people who are ultimately responsible for the way a charity is run and who, who vote on, on decisions. Um, again, more likely uh, to know them as board or committee members, uh, maybe directors, maybe trustees. Um, but it's this group of individuals who together are ultimately responsible for overseeing the charity's operations and making sure it's working towards its charitable purpose. It's worth noting that responsible persons may employ or may engage staff to carry out some of their day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, if that occur occurs, the staff are responsible to and would report to the organisation's responsible persons. Uh, again, we've got a pretty useful fact sheet on responsible persons and the link is there on your screen. So if you have been um, elected to your charities board or um its committee, you are a responsible person and that's who we're referring to when we say responsible person and the responsible persons of each charity must know the obligations that the charity has to the ACNC and there, there's an overview here on the screen of what, what the what main obligations are. A charity has to maintain its charity registration, so that means it must continue to operate in a not-for-profit way and it must continue to um, have a solely charitable purpose or purposes and, and pursue those purposes with its activities. It has to keep records. 
So responsible persons sh should be aware of this, that keeping records is an obligation that a charity has, and there must be correct and accurate financial records as well as operational records. There's an obligation to um, report to the ACNC, and this is, in short, this is filling in an annual form or a statement called the Annual Information Statement. And that, that will be due at different times of the year for different charities, depending on their own uh, operations. But the responsible persons of a charity need to be aware of this requirement in particular and, and know when they are required to submit this statement. The responsible persons need to remember that there's an obligation for charities to notify the ACNC of changes. And in particular, that's changes to the charity's legal name. So if you have a change in name, you're gonna to have to let us know. The change to the, any change to the address for service, which is the formal address to which we um, send notifications and, and correspondence. Any change to the charity's governing document, which, you might know as the constitution or the rules and uh, changes in the list of responsible persons. So this is probably something that comes up a little bit more often than the other three that I just mentioned. So if there's a, someone who stepped down from the board, someone new has come onto the board, the charity has an obligation, obligation to let the ACNC know about that. All of these notifications can be done online via the ACNC charity portal as our uh, cartoon friend there on the screen is, is currently <laughs> doing. And finally, you have to meet the governance standards. These are a particular set of um, standards that charities must meet to, to maintain registration. And we'll go through them, them a little bit more, in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. But those uh, five points there on the screen are the main things as an overview that charities responsible persons really need to know about to, to make sure that their organization is uh, meeting its obligations to the ACNC. Now, uh, the governance standards, just got a, a quick little bit of a mention there. Um, that's one of the ongoing obligations for, for registered charities. Uh, they have to meet the ACNC's governance standards. Now, the governance standards are a set of five minimum standards for running a charity. Uh, they include uh, standards that cover things like charity processes, activities, um, governance and, and compliance. Uh, the standards require charities too, and we're going to there we go. Demonstrate that they're a not-for-profit, uh, work towards charitable purposes and provide information about its purposes to the public, uh, that they take uh, reasonable steps to be accountable to their members and provide them with uh, decent and adequate opportunities to raise concerns about how the charity is governed. Um, got to comply with the law, as it says there. Uh, so that means not commit a serious offence, things like fraud, that sort of stuff, under Australian law, or breach a law that may result in a penalty of 60 penalty units or more. Um, got to take, uh, take reasonable steps to ensure that responsible persons are not disqualified from managing a corporation or disqualified from being a responsible person of a registered charity. Um, now, the fifth standard, which looks at duties of responsible persons. We're gonna launch into a little bit more detail about that in the next, uh, next couple of minutes. Uh, now, for new charity board members, there are seven duties and you need to know them. We're gonna cover them right now. More on these standards can be found via those two uh, links at the bottom of the page. Okay, so jumping straight to that standard, which looks at the duties of responsible persons. There are, there are seven main things to consider um, in this standard. And, and as Chris mentioned, it, it, does, uh, it is covered by governance standard number five. Um, it, uh, this standard requires that the charity's responsible persons, number one, act with reasonable care and diligence, that they act honestly and fairly in the best interests of the charity, to not mis misuse um, the position that they have as a responsible person. Also to not misuse in any information that they may gain in the position as a responsible person. They need to disclose any conflicts of interest that they may have. Um, they need to ensure that the charity is managed financially, it's managed um, responsibly. And also, which I suppose leads on to the seventh point, that they are not allowed to allow the charity to operate while insolvent. We will explain that in, in, in a few minutes, but um, I suppose if you're 
if you're adequately covering 0.6 there, I think 0.7 would probably become redundant because it's unlikely that you can do set you can do six and then also do not do seven. Okay, um, we'll have a look at each of these um, duties in a little bit more detail, so you as a new responsible person know exactly what the ACNC expects of you in your new role. Okay, now the first one, uh, duty number one is to act with reasonable care and diligence. So as you can see, there's some key points there up on the up on the slide, but uh, as, a, as a charity board member, um, you, you are gonna have to fulfill a number of, of different duties. It's a big responsibility, you probably realise that. Uh, now it's a responsibility not only to the charity and its members and those who it works with, but also to the wider community. Uh, now the first duty that we've got sort of reinforces, really emphasises this responsibility uh, and the importance of exercising care and diligence in your role or roles. It involves playing an active role in guiding and monitoring the charity's development and management and being aware of, uh, of obligations. Uh, you also need to stay informed about the charity, uh, informed about things like its work, uh, its finances, I guess what the, the general health or the general state that it's in. Uh, now being informed isn't just knowing about or being aware, it's also I guess a, a level of understanding as well. Um, if for example a reasonable person receives some important financial information about their charity, it's not enough just to read or, or just to look at the figures. Uh, they need to be able to understand the figures. They need to be able to know what that means for the charity. As a general point, you need to be an informed and engaged board member. Uh, now, other ways to comply with this standard are to read any board papers, uh, ensure you are, uh, I guess, properly, appropriately informed about matters on which you need to make a decision uh, and, and attend board meetings on a, on a regular basis. Now, Board members should be aware that missing several board meetings in a row without a compelling reason to do so might be seen as a breach of this duty. It's also important to remember that you can always ask for help or seek the knowledge of, um, I guess, professionals or even the expertise of another responsible person. For example, you know, if you've got issues with understanding the financials, go and have a word to you know, the treasurer. Um, but you should always carefully consider any advice you were given and ask questions to ensure that you understand it. Yeah, that last one's an important point. It's not enough to simply just sit on the board and nod your head and yeah. pretend to know what's going on. If you don't, it's <laughs> part of the responsibility to act with care and diligence is exactly as Chris described, um, the responsibility to ask questions and to find out more information if it helps you make a more informed decision. Um, the second um, point that we mentioned before was that the the Government Centre 5 requires that charity responsible persons act honestly and in the best interests of the charity and for the charity's purposes. So if you do hold a position of responsibility at the charity, the, the, the decisions you make and I suppose your considerations in coming to a decision must be with the charity's interest um, at the forefront. The um, any personal interests or, or interests of other organisations that you may be involved in, or, or even if you're not involved in them, they, they need to be set aside. So when you're acting in, in your role as a charity board member, you need to step into your charity board member shoes and, and have a look at your actions from the perspective of the charity and, and ask yourself what, what would be best for the charity in this situation. For example, if you're making a decision at a board meeting, um, be diligent, as we mentioned before. Well, don't just don't just follow the crowd. If if you should always think what um, what you you should always do. Sorry, what you think is best for your charity, even if sometimes it means that you might be taking a different view to other board members. And it's an important point because there's nothing wrong with that. And sometimes the best outcomes come on the back of hard fought. Yeah. Um, decisions at, at the board level and it may include some um, discussion, debate, even argument, yeah. but at least those issues uh, are, are teased out and and um, explained, discussed and, and, and put through put through the, the rigour that they should be before a decision is made. It also shows that board members who are willing to do that and are able to do that are well informed and well engaged as well uh, and that's always a positive. Absolutely. So 
your duty as the responsible person of a charity is to do the best you can on its behalf. You're, you're acting in the interest of the charity to, to guide the organisation so that it can do the best work that, that it can. Now, duty number three is, uh, it's pretty clear, don't, use, don't misuse your position as a responsible person. It's linked to duty two in a way. Um, I mean, part of acting, I guess, in a charity's best interest as a board member is to ensure that you, as a responsible person, don't you misuse your position. Any actions which might run counter to this duty are a misuse of your position of responsibility. Uh, an example of a breach of this duty might be someone, I guess, running a charity who uses their position to pay a company owned by friends or, or relatives when there really is no reason to make such a payment. Um, something like no goods or services have been provided to the charity, for example. Your role as a charity board member isn't about providing benefits to yourself or, or to others. It is to ensure the charity is doing the best it can to further its purposes and to help its beneficiaries. Misusing your position uh, in, in this way will not only result in a breach of the governance standards, but it can also lead to other serious uh, problems, criminal charges perhaps as well. Um, so yeah, make sure that you comply with duty number three. The next one is, um sort of follows on from that one. So don't misuse your position as a responsible person with information either. So you're going to come across some information that um, that may be sensitive or, or even confidential. It's important that as a responsible person, you remember the duty to to treat that information with the the care and and um, importance that it deserves. And if there is something sensitive or confidential that it's kept in-house and not misused for other purposes, whether that be for personal gain or whatnot. And it doesn't just cover the obvious stuff like financial information, contracts, project management and, and personnel issues, that sort of thing. It can cover information about a charity's operations or, or future direction or you know what happened at last Tuesday's board meeting and that sort of thing. So make sure you, you handle information with discretion and respect. Um, be careful of, or be aware of the nature of the information, how sensitive it may be, and um, act appropriately with that information. Duty number five is, uh, it looks at conflicts of interest, um, uh, disclosing actual potential or perceived uh, conflicts of interest. Now, um, board members, need to become skilled at separating their role with the charity from the rest of their everyday life. Uh, it's a bit of a juggling act sometimes, but doing so helps guard against conflicts of interest. There's always crossovers between different parts of our lives, um, between personal, professional, uh, work, all of that sort of stuff. Anyone who serves as a responsible person for a charity needs to take care that these intertwined parts of their lives don't uh, I guess, improperly impact on, on the charity they serve. Now, for charities, responsible persons, having a conflict of interest doesn't necessarily need to be, I guess, a, a, a bad thing. The key is how they are managed. As part of their duties, responsible persons should properly address any actual or perceived conflicts of interest. This means that there needs to be clear and open disclosure of any conflict between their duty to act for the charity and their personal or private interest, as well as making sure they are not part of any discussions or decision making on a matter where there is such a conflict. Um, responsible persons, board, you know, board members, they can remove themselves from the room when these discussions take place. Uh, that's a very common way of ensuring that there's a, a bit of a a separation there that there's uh, conflicts of interest are I guess ruled out of the equation. Um, you should also ensure that your charity has a policy on conflicts of interest and maintains a, a, a register of, of interest. This type of approach should be followed even if the conflict of interest is perceived or potential rather than just you know actual. Um, a conflict should be disclosed whenever an independent observer could doubt that a responsible person is acting in the best interests of a charity. Now we've talked in uh, webinars oh, back a couple of months ago now about potential perceived and actual conflicts of interest. Uh, actual 
conflicts of interest, as the name suggests, are conflicts which are occurring or have occurred. Potential covers those that might occur uh, and perceived are those that perhaps from the outside, uh, they're situations that could give the impression that someone might be influenced by a conflicting interest. For new charity board members, it's a good idea to find out whether your organisation holds a register of interests document. Uh, and that's a document where board members can publicly disclose their interests to ensure transparency and good governance. Again, the ACNC has a great guide on managing conflicts of interest. There's the link there. Uh, and July was our webinar on managing conflicts of interest. If you want to go back to our website, go to forward slash webinars, have a bit of a look and uh, you'll find out a lot more about the topic. It is a tricky one, so it's worth having a look or reading through the guide there. Some people, it's not only is it tricky, it's just something that people overlook, particularly that concept of a perceived conflict of interest. So it's worth having having a look at the July webinar or having a look at the guidance on the website. And now on to uh, the next duty, um, ensuring the financial affairs of the charity are managed responsibly. And of course, this is an important aspect of a uh, responsible person's um, role in a charity. Um, and for new charity board members, the, the ACNC's emphasis is clear. You don't have to be a financial genius to be on a charity <laughs> board, but you, you really do need to be aware of the finances and, and at least be willing to ask questions about a charity's finances. So you should have at least a, a basic grasp of a financial statement. And, and if you do pull up your charity's financial information, you should again, have a, a basic understanding of what's going on or at least be able to interpret it in a way that gives you a, a fairly clear impression of the, the financial state of your organisation. Yeah. Of course, it's it's um, perfectly reasonable um, for charity board members to ask questions of their, their treasurer or, or, or financial officer or whoever, whoever's sort of given that designation at the board level to be responsible for this sort of thing. If then if they're not sure about something in the financial information. In fact, that sort of interaction with that person on the board should be encouraged. Yes. This should be a, a regular avenue of conversation with the other board members that, and the treasurer or whoever it might be, should be able to answer the questions posed to them. And, and if not, um, should be able to go away and figure out the answer or find yeah. the answer and then bring it back to the board. Yeah. So ultimately, a good approach when you're considering financial matters is is to consider how consider how any decision you make could affect the health the financial health of the charity and of course charities should have processes for managing their money responsibly um, and and protecting themselves against any financial mismanagement or fraud and that may be um, you know sign offs for certain spending or yeah. approval processes and that and that sort of thing seventh uh, seventh duty and uh, it gets a little bit of a mention here uh, about charity charity solvency you're not allowed to operate it not allowed to allow uh, your charity to operate whilst it is insolvent um, and a key part of any board members efforts uh, to ensure proper financial management in their organisation uh, is, is this duty. Insolvency is when an organisation cannot pay all its debts when they fall due. That's pretty much the basic, uh, I guess, definition of what insolvency is. If a responsible person perhaps reasonably suspects that the charity cannot pay its debts when they become due, then they should take all reasonable steps to prevent a charity from taking on more debt. Uh, in addition to this, the charities board should regularly review its financial position and ensure there's enough money to pay for its activities. And in addition, again, as, as we've mentioned just before, have that dialogue uh, between yourselves, your financial officers, your treasurers. If in doubt, get the knowledge, ask some questions and seek out, uh, seek out the answers that you require. Now, um, we've just gone over the specific duties that charity board members or responsible persons have to the ACNC under the governance standards, but there are a number of other just general good governance tips that new charity board members should should take note of and, and, and should consider when they think about how they're going to approach their position on the charity board. And um, 
when we speak about governance, we refer to the actions a, a charity and its responsible persons take to ensure that it's effectively run and, and properly run. That's, that's what we mean when we say good governance or, or governance, it's just basically the operations of, of the charity. Um, now we've touched on um, inductions and handovers a little bit at the beginning, but we do really recommend that a new charity board member asks, um, asks for a, an induction pack or a welcome pack or, or something like that to prepare them for their role on the charity board. And again, we say the word pack, welcome pack. I mean, it doesn't have to, doesn't have to be extensive or um, expensively produced flyers, magazines or anything like that. It's in short, it's, it's information that the board member needs to know to be able to fulfill their duties properly. And just in the way that it would be for, for any new person going to a new organisation to do anything new, there needs to be some uh, level of instruction given to that person and and a handover again pack or or, or set of instructions or, or some important things to know mm. is a really crucial thing for the person to be able to um, do their job properly I suppose um, so this can include um, uh, copies of the charity's governing document annual reports financial reports other information that allows the person to to uh, get access to some important charity information or accounts. Um, it might even have step-by-step -step descriptions of, of important charity processes, you know, how to, how to get approval to spend money or how to, how to log into certain computer systems <laughs> to be able to manage the personnel and yeah. volunteers and that sort of thing. So from, from the really simple and practical up to the more um, uh, the overarching, there, there should be, uh, the information covered for the new person so that they're able to complete their role effectively. Um, and if you're taking over a specific board role from someone else, that might be you're now the treasurer when someone else was before, for example, um, you should uh, coordinate some sort of handover process where you can have a good chat to the, the previous holder of that position and, and talk about what, what the role requires and even try and get a handle on some of the difficulties or or struggles that that person may have had in the, in the previous term and it might be that you can make some changes and improvements based on their experiences again we've we've mentioned uh governing document governing documents um throughout this, in this webinar um it's important for responsible persons to to be familiar with it uh now governing document it's a formal document uh, and what it does, it sets out the charity's uh, charitable purpose or purposes. Um, it, you know, the organisation's aims, mission, um, what you do, uh, who you work with, who you help. Um, it also sets out uh, how the, you know, the, the charity operates on a, on a not-for-profit basis and the way that the charity's board or committee uh, makes decisions or consults members. New board members, as we said, should seek out this document uh, and should familiarise yourselves with it. And once you do so, again, make sure that you, you know where it is. Don't, again, don't just have it stashed away somewhere where you don't know where it is in a folder somewhere on your desktop, on a computer or in a filing cabinet somewhere. Your, your governing document needs to be, uh, I guess, an active document. We, we say it should be a living and breathing relevant uh, document, um, one that's known one that's also regularly updated uh, when when required as well. Uh, charities are not uh, standing still and if they don't stand still there might be times where you do need to update your, your um, governing document uh, and if you do you'll need to let us know but please you know feel free to do so. The ACNC as we said needs to be notified of any changes you do make to your governing document uh, we also need to get a copy of the documents if you've, if you've made a change. If you do, um, and if you want more information on, on governing document, there's a, there's a lovely little link uh, there. And uh, go have a read, have a look, learn a little bit more. Meetings and agendas are important as well for the for a responsible person to um, have a handle of. So, uh, they're a prime example of good governance practice and um, ensuring members are, are kept informed about a charity's activities. 
each charity will organise and run meetings in, in subtly different ways and it depends on all sorts of variables, it depends on, it depends on um, the work it does, stakeholders, partners for example. Um, there are even times of the year where meetings may have to be held more often to ensure certain things are, are still on track and that may be if you're running a, a particular project or, or something new for example. Now an important feature of a, a well-run productive meeting is a good agenda and your agenda should include the, the topics to be discussed at the meeting and the likely time that you expect each of them to take, the responsibility for each of the discussions. It might be that certain people are responsible for certain topics and need to present to the board or whoever the broader membership on certain things. And the purpose of the item being discussed. So does a decision need to be made or does it just need to be noted? Is it just for information? Uh, is the organisation seeking advice? Um, or is it just for discussion only? Yeah. Those sorts of things are, are pretty important and it, and it keeps the people at the meeting informed and, and I suppose engaged because, I mean, we've all been at meetings where you sit back and you think, geez, what's the point of this? <laughs> you don't want that to happen at your charity um, meeting. You want, you want everyone there to be engaged and um, paying attention to everything that goes on. So yeah. that's one really good way to make sure that that does happen. Um, so just take the time to prepare a good agenda make sure you invite the right people to attend the meeting. Some meetings will require broader membership, some meetings are just for the for the, the board itself, yeah. so have a think about what the purpose of the meeting is and make sure that board members and, and whoever else is informed well in advance. They might be sending an email with the agenda um, before the meeting or or however you might do it, but just that um, just making sure they're um, aware of what's going to be discussed is a really important step. Yep. Now, I'm getting a little bit of deja vu here because we've found our way back to AGMs again. Now, last month's webinar uh, that we that we looked after uh, discussed in detail this topic uh, and uh, as well as the ins and outs of, of how to run a, an AGM. Now, a number of charities might have held theirs by now or they're probably getting pretty close to staging their AGM. They may have already given the formal notice, informed their members and that sort of stuff. Um, if you haven't, get onto it, check out your documents and all of that sort of stuff to ensure you're doing the right thing. But uh, generally, AGMs, uh, they are an important good governance uh, tool, good governance practice. Uh, it basically sees organisations able to present a report to their members about how the charity is travelling it's financially and what it's been up to over the, over the past 12 months. Uh, it, charities can use AGMs to make changes to their governing documents or, or even their name. Uh, they can also have board elections at their AGM and this means that uh, those responsible persons uh, may, may change uh, at, at this time. Those running a charity need to be aware that if they use the AGM to change its legal name, governing documents or responsible persons, again, please let the ACNC know. Uh, and that's all done through the charity portal. Now, there's no specific requirement under ACNC legislation to hold an AGM. However, doing so is a good way for your charity to demonstrate that it is accountable to its members uh, and that's outlined in, in Governance Standard 2. There's also no requirement for charities to advise of the date of your AGM or register your upcoming AGM with the ACNC. Uh, it's important to note. But there's a caveat here, you will still need to follow any requirements around holding an AGM as set out in your governing documents or, or as, as they know, model rules. Uh, and for many organisations, if they are incorporated associations, uh, they will have a state regulator that will uh, perhaps set out those guidelines, how much notice you need to give uh, and, and that sort of stuff. So be aware of those. Uh, and yes, uh, there might be other Commonwealth uh, agencies as well as state and territory agencies uh, that may be responsible. You may have obligations to when it comes to AGM, legal structure, those sorts of things. So again, be aware of the requirements uh, and, and continue to follow them. We have spoken a fair bit about responsible financial management, so it's just um, something worth it reiterating. Um, a responsible person needs to make sure the charity has the resources required um, to be able to do its work and help protect those resources, use them efficiently and of course lawfully. And this may cover um, things like reserves, keeping some money tucked away, 
budgeting, spending, and other elements of financial management. And again, this is the point that we really want to drive home that it, it's it's really important to have a basic level of financial understanding when looking at these these things. There's no good looking at a financial statement of the charity, just having really no idea what it says to you. So um, it might be worth for your organisation looking into some training maybe to um, have your board members uh, up to speed with what they need to look for when they're analysing a financial statement. Yeah. You've got a responsibility uh, to keep records and, and responsible persons need to know what those record keeping obligations are and who it needs to report to. Now, as you can see up there on the screen, there's uh, there's two different types of records that, that we generally talk about. Um, you've got to keep certain financial or written financial and operational records. Uh, now, you can keep records in any format you choose as long as they're easy to find. Now, that can obviously be and is more likely to be in electronic form. You can also develop your own system or process to keep these records as well. Uh, you have to keep records for seven years and you have to keep the records in English or in a form that can be easily translated into English. Now, your charity doesn't have to provide records to the ACNC unless asked. Um, but, of course, keeping proper records can help your charity on a number of fronts. It can help it show that it's continuing to be run as a not-for-profit and pursuing its charitable purposes, uh, help understand that your charity is in good financial health, um, allow responsible people to make good decisions, uh, assess that the right kinds of decisions are being made, communicate your charity's activities and finances, uh, helps you prepare reports as required, all of those sorts of things, uh, as well as meeting obligations under you know, ACNC Act, tax uh, responsibilities, other relevant laws, that sort of stuff. Again, we've got a, a pretty good rundown on uh, record keeping uh, via the link there at the bottom of the slide. One other thing to bear in mind when you're acting as a responsible person is the uh, management of internal disputes. Now, most charities and, and board members will experience some sort of difference of opinion or, or some kind of dispute at some stage. And um, internal disputes can, can be um, you know, across the board table, amongst the directors, or it might be between volunteers, staff members, others. It can happen throughout the whole range of the organisation. Um, now, of course, we're not saying that everyone has to get along like best friends, that that might not happen. Um, be great if it did, but you know, it might not happen, that's reality. But there are a number of um, um, things to bear in mind when you're a responsible person of a charity to ensure that any disputes don't derail um, the work of the organisation and the, the functioning of, of the board and all the staff involved. So remember the charity's charitable purposes and what is paramount. People can coexist and, and work together, maybe not getting along as best as they possibly could all the time, but once it starts, once a dispute starts to affect the charity, <coughs> excuse me, as a whole, um, it puts the charity at risk <coughs> of, of breaching the ACNC Act. I might do some reading. <laughs> yeah, here. I might do some go. talking. That's all right. <laughs> There we go. Um, yeah, having some having some policies on on handling disputes uh, and and that sort of stuff are, are very are very important. Helps arbitrate, helps uh, resolve uh, disputes and 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 that sort of thing. Um, there are times perhaps where uh, there may be the need for a a mediator, as we call them, or an impartial advisor. Um, now they don't have to be. They can be professional. They don't have to be. They can be just an, I guess, an interested or uh, interested or unbiased third party, I suppose, who can sit there and listen to both sides of a, an argument or both sides of a dispute, and it's trusted by both parties can come up with a bit of a solution, uh, a way forward, I suppose. Um, so that that's another another uh, thing to be, I guess, aware of. Last thing to be aware of is that the ACNC does not uh, handle. Well, sorry, mediate, sorry, internal disputes. That's something that we, we don't do. Um, so be aware of that. Again, we have a, a guide on, on dealing with internal disputes. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll include a link to that in the follow-up email that we'll, we'll send out to everyone after this, uh, after this webinar is done. We've mentioned also 
uh, the responsibilities that your organisation, your charity might have to other regulators. Um, now, while the ACNC is the national charity regulator here in Australia, um, there are a number of others, uh, state, territory, Commonwealth uh, level regulators um, that your charity may have obligations to. Uh, here on the screen, as you can see, there's some examples of some of the organisations that you that you may have responsibilities to, everyone from the ATO and say ASIC or ORIC to um, state and territory bodies that look after fundraising and, and incorporation and uh, that sort of thing. Again, we've got a good rundown on our site, that's on our other regulators page and uh, the link is there at the, at the bottom of the slide. Um, be aware of them, it's always handy to know who you've actually got an answer to and who you've got to be responsible to. Oh, I'll have another go, I think <coughs> my throat is allowing me to talk. Now, let's just have a look at some key points to remember throughout today's webinar before we go into some questions that have come through. So number one, um, know your role. So new board members should be clear on the role and what they have to do. And uh, it's a good idea to provide a, a position or role description for people that come onto a board. And we mentioned that induction pack. So have some sort of information that that person can um, have a look at and, um, and understand what, what's required of them in, in taking on their new role on the board. Um, responsible persons should be uh, aware of their obligations to the ACNC, um, you know, the governance standards, uh, ongoing obligations, and they should also be obviously aware of their responsibilities to the ACNC as a responsible person as well. well know where your governing document is, know what it says, um, familiarise yourselves with it, uh, and ensure, you know, play your role in ensuring that the, that the document is a relevant one. Uh, and is a gathering dust in a corner somewhere. Meetings are really important. So board members should um, should always be prepared for meetings and, and this includes familiarising themselves with, with the agendas in advance and, and being prepared to ask questions and answer questions to particularly of the membership that might be there. Financial management, um, don't underestimate um, the importance of this as a board member, it shouldn't be lumped all on say the treasurer or the financial officer or whatever staff you've got looking after the board really needs to know um, what's happening with the charity's finances. Yeah. You have to keep records, uh, they've got to be adequate, they cover finances, they also cover operational records as we explained just before um, and as a you know, re responsible person, board members, they do have a crucial role in this uh, and finally ensure that you're uh, that you're doing the right thing uh, in your responsibilities to other regulators, um, state, federal, uh, territory, that sort of stuff. Be aware of uh, who you need to be responsible to. Uh, it goes beyond the, uh, the ACNC. So, now that we've run through all of those bits and pieces, we've got a couple of, we've got a couple of questions. Um, and there's one that's come through about uh, the term, someone said to us that they've heard the term or know of the term uh, delegation or delegating duties. Um, Matt, did you want to just provide a little bit of a yep, sure. little bit of information about what we mean or what it is meant uh, when we say that someone has delegated their, their duties or, or responsibilities? Yeah, sure. Some, some responsibilities of a board can be delegated, which which sort of means handed over, formally handed over to, to other people to complete. So this means that certain tasks that would ordinarily be um, the domain of the board or certain board members can can just be carried out by other individuals. And, and this is perhaps if, if maybe for larger organisations, someone like a CEO or for smaller organisations, even a volunteer, maybe head volunteer or a staff member or certain subcommittee. So there are a range of ways that this can happen. Um, well, it's important to remember though that any um, delegation will depend on your charity's rules, so, so whatever's stipulated in its governing document and also any legislation that might apply to your charity. It may be that certain things are only um, allowed via a, a board decision or formal resolution, that mm. sort of thing. So it, it might be that you can't delegate everything to, to someone else as a, as a board. Um, it's, it's worth checking your, your organisation's rules and any legislation that applies. Um, and remember, even if you do delegate some things, it, it, the board itself still bears the ultimate responsibility for any decisions 
that are made. So while it can delegate some of the duties, it it can't hand over its responsibility. They can't tell the CEO that they, they want the CEO to do a certain task and then wash their hands of <laughs> the the results of that task if they don't go the way that they they wanted it to. So that the board does bear ultimate responsibility, even on tasks that have been um, delegated to others. Um, so, it, it, and if, if you do um, delegate, it's important to have that delegation in writing, um, particularly if you're delegating particular powers that the yeah. board would ordinarily have. If, if you're giving, handing over certain powers to individuals or other groups, then, then it's worth having that in writing to so that everyone can see exactly what that means and, and what they're allowed to do. And delegations aren't something to be done lightly. No, that's either. right. Yeah, they're, they're things that you should perhaps think about. And it's probably something that's well worth discussing at a at a meeting, uh, at a board meeting to, to have a chat about it. We've got time for one more? Yeah, we've probably got time for one more. What have we got? Um, have we got? Uh, uh, someone's asked about the idea of behind a committee or a subcommittee. So so they have, ah. a, they have a committee, that they have a board, they also have a committee and a subcommittee <laughs> not quite uh, sure what the purposes of these are and if they oh, mean anything different. It's sort of a little bit of a flow on here from the idea of delegation in a way. Um, committees are things that boards can set up um, because there might be, you know, difficulties might be a challenge to get all board members to, to, uh, to meet. Um, there might be other times, and this is something that's pretty common actually, committees uh, can be set up uh, to help the board, you know, it, draw in the expertise or the knowledge of people who aren't on the board, uh, but who have relevant knowledge on, on certain matters. Um, these can be called subcommittees, uh, they're sometimes called standing committees. Uh, I've even heard them called ad hoc committees, which is always interesting. Um, yeah, example of one of these might be a board might get a, a finance committee or a point of finance committee it includes maybe an independent person with some accounting experience and that would help ensure that the charity's financial position is you know examined closely and regularly uh, and, and maybe done so more often than what the board may be able to do in its more normal uh, duties. Um, in this way the, the committee would be able to you know help provide the board with better information and that leads to better decisions Although, of course, again, the board retains overall responsibility on things like this. Um, committees can make recommendations to the board, but they generally don't make decisions that bind the charity on their own behalf. Usually the recommendations go to the board, the board then discusses them, debates them and makes the decision based on that recommendation. Um, now, your, your charity, again, uh, might have a governing document uh, or information in the governing document about how you can establish committees, uh, what they can be used for, who can be a member. Um, make sure you check your rules before establishing a committee. And look, if you want to establish a committee and your governing documents don't explicitly say one way or the other about what you can and can't do, maybe again, it's time to have a bit of a think about changing those governing documents, updating them and, and bringing them uh, into, I guess, the, the modern era by making them relevant and having them cover things like you know, committees and that sort of stuff. Um, board members should, should, I guess, help their charity stay focused on their objectives uh, and, and manage their finances effectively and comply with the, you know, the operational and the, and the legal and the, and the ethical requirements of, of the charity. Um, just before we finish, yeah. um, someone just asked, we, we mentioned financial, uh, knowing what financial, uh, knowing what your finances are as a, yeah. as a board member. There, there are just a few um, uh, organisations that help um, with this sort of thing. So if you, if you were looking for some uh, resources to help you understand charity finances or simple things um, so, such as interpreting a financial statement mm. and that sort of thing. Um, you can have a look at some um, the, the CPA or the CAANZ or Accounting for Good website. Um, we've got a few links on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash reporting, which um, has information that, that we've got to help yeah. you out, but also some links to external uh, resources as well that, that, that may help. And we will include um, a link to that page on the follow-up email that comes out after this webinar. So it really is worth taking the time to have a look at what's available. Some may be 
paid training. Some might be um, done for free and there might be some online courses that you can take, but it's worth um, taking the time to familiarize yourself with the uh, with the, the layout and, and the, the information that's generally contained in a financial statement so that um, you do know what you're looking at and you're able to make some informed decisions as a charity board member. And that, that applies to, to tiny organisations as well as yeah, larger ones. And a bit of, um, just a bit of a, I guess, a shout out to, to um, Inscola. Um, which we have links to on our site, uh, national, the National National Standard Chart, chart of Accounts. Um, go have a look, it's um, on our website forward slash NSCOA, I hope I've got that right. Yeah. Um, have a look at that, that's a very good little, I guess, basic rundown of a number of uh, financial terms um, and, and other bits and pieces, uh, standards and, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, again, well worth a look. And INSCO is particularly focused upon the charitable sector as well. So it's very relevant there. Um, now, we've got some ways to stay in touch. There's a lot of normal ways of staying in touch. Um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of that sort of stuff. Um, We've just about reached the end of things. So we might wander off and allow people to have lunch or brunch or whatever they want to have. Um, we will hang around perhaps just a touch for any last minute questions that have come through. Thank you to Michael and to Heath for looking after those. Again, if we don't get around to answering those questions, uh, drop us an email, it's via education at acnc.gov.au. Yeah. Um, and yeah, drop us an email and we'll endeavor to get a answer back to you. Um, now we've got a survey that we'll flick up after we're done here. So we would really appreciate if you take the time to uh, complete it. It's only, I think, three questions. So it's a couple of minutes. Uh, and yeah, if you've got any extra comments or any questions about the webinar, uh, again, education at acnc.gov.au. Uh, yeah, thanks to Heath, thanks to Michael, thanks to Matt, and we will wander off. Thank you very much for joining us today. See you later. Thank you. Bye.